whether it is infiltrating a heretic stronghold and bringing it crashing down from within, plunging from space into the heart of a ferocious siege, or scouring worlds clean of foes riding in squadrons of armored transports. Space Marines excel in all manner of war. It is the foremost duty of the battle companies to be at the forefront of their chapter's campaigns. First Company A Space Marine chapter's first company is its most elite fighting force. A warrior is only appointed to it after decades of war in the scout, reserve, and battle companies, and after having performed legendary deeds of bravery. To be one of this number is to be an exemplar of the chapter, and a superb example of what it means to be a space marine in the highest sense. There are no ways of war that the warriors of the first company have failed to master, and any battlefield role is second nature to them. Whether it's holding ground against endless hordes of scuttling tyrannid horrors, storming the formidable leg bastions of an enemy titan, meeting the towering wraith constructs of the Aldari, or engaging in ferocious duels with lithe Drukhari blademasters. First Company veterans are equal to the task. Most frequently, First Company squads are attached to other Space Marine strike forces rather than the entire formation fighting as one. Primarily, they serve as devastatingly powerful warriors adept at any role required of them. When working with other forces, they serve as peerless mentors, sharing with their brothers their hard-won experience and wisdom. To the rest of the chapter, they are heroes, and their mere presence strengthens their brothers' resolve and compels them to fight all the harder. Veteran squads take their pick from the chapter's armories. Thus, each warrior wages war with his preferred weaponry for the task at hand. Space Marine captains know that veteran squads are best utilized when giving a wide remit to prosecute the battlefield in whichever way they deem best. Their experience such that they can swiftly identify where they are most needed and what tactics to apply to bring victory. As such, veteran squads are much less rigid in their doctrine than the battle brothers of other companies. Stern Guard veterans are masters of ranged warfare with all manner of Space Marine guns. They exemplify the power that can be brought to bear by the union of mighty Space Marine and sacred bolt gun, and they bring to war a range of specialized ammunition types, all suited to different foes. Some possess unstable flux cores, which make them the bane of heavily armored foes. Others replace the core and tip of the standard bolt round with thousands of needles that tear into the target and pump mutagenic poison which eats organic enemies from the inside out. Some bolts allow the Space Marine to engage targets at even further range 
thanks to additional propellant. Particularly sophisticated bolts release gouts of superheated gas that reach and slay foes embedded deeply in cover. Vanguard veteran squads are ever on the move, using their jump packs to blast from foe to foe. Wielding all manner of heirloom power weapons, relic blades, thunder hammers, and lightning claws, they make a mockery of the thickest enemy armor and the toughest alien chitin with their strikes. Made all the more devastating thanks to the incredible skill with which the vanguard wield them. Each kill they make is a celebrated act, one that honors their weapons machine spirits as well as the battle brothers who bore them into battle in the past. Rivalries often develop between the Stern Guard and Vanguard veterans, each determined to kill more foes, win more battles, and secure the most dangerous duties. Nevertheless, all are battle brothers, and when the situation calls, will gladly lay down their lives for each other. The Blade Guard veterans go to war covered in purity seals, clad in finely crafted armor, and bedecked with icons of victory and heraldic devices. Their towering storm shields are the work of many generations of toiling chapter serfs, and the powerful force field generators they contain are said to protect the bearer's soul as much as his flesh. This war gear is brought out from the chapter's reliquaries in times of war, and when seen in battle, reminds all brothers of the legacy they have sworn to uphold since their induction to the chapter. More formally known as Tactical Dreadnought Armor, Terminator Armor is the most impervious plate ever conceived by the Imperium. The ancient technologies required to maintain its bonded ceramide plating and fully electro-motivated exoskeleton are highly mysterious and restricted. Only a handful of Forge Worlds have access to the means to build new suits, and scant few chapters have the knowledge to fully repair those damaged in extremely hazardous theaters of battle they are deployed in. Terminator armor is precious for another reason. One shoulder pad on each suit bears the Crux Terminatus, a sacred cross-shaped icon sculpted in relief. It is said that within it is a fragment of the Emperor's own armor. The most fortunate chapters have access to Terminator armor more revered and ancient yet than the Indominus pattern most commonly seen on the battlefields of the 41st millennium. Catafactory and Tartaros are foremost amongst these rare patterns. Each relic Terminator suit is a marvel in its own right, a working symbol of the Imperium's technological might. Only in the direst circumstances are these artifacts deployed by those chapters they belong to, and they have turned the tide of countless battles thought lost. Regardless of which pattern of Terminator armor a space marine is clad in, 
To be trusted with such a treasured relic is a great honor, and is the truest statement of the warrior's skill, courage, honor, discipline, and fortitude. Battle Companies The Codex Astartes decrees that the second through the fifth companies of a Space Marine chapter are the Battle Companies. It is to these mighty and flexible formations that the principal combat duties of a Space Marine chapter are assigned. At the head of each of these formations is an array of warriors, leaders, and veterans who are true exemplars of their chapter. Battle companies are led by captains with two supporting lieutenants. A chaplain joins them who is responsible for the company's spiritual welfare. The company champion is one of the formation's finest warriors, a fierce bladesman who guards the captain and the company's honor with his life. To the company ancient falls the most honored task, to bear the company standard to war. Alongside these individuals stand the company veterans, outstanding warriors raised from the company squads. In times of war, a battle company might also be accompanied by one or more librarians. These fearsome battle psychers lend their considerable powers to the strike force, as well as provide invaluable guidance and wisdom. In addition to his company command duties, each captain of the battle companies has a number of titles and duties, traditionally tied to the company he leads. At times, they can be purely ceremonial, and at the discretion of the chapter master, can be altered according to the needs of the day. Nominally, however, the Codex states that the second company captain is the master of the watch. The third company captain is the master of the arsenal. The fourth company captain is the master of the fleet, and the fifth company captain is master of the marches. To these individuals, the chapter master entrusts many vital tasks. Whether it be overseeing the deployment and disposition of the chapter's fighting strength, the homeworld's defenses, managing the chapter's vast inventory of munitions and war gear, commanding the chapter's mighty fleet in battle, or assessing the most desperate pleas for aid. Not all chapters follow these doctrines precisely, over time developing their own specific titles and duties for their officers. Each battle company, principally, has ten squads, six of the battle line role, two of close support, and two of fire support, each with ten space marines. The Codex, however, makes provision for there to be twenty squads for when squads from the reserve companies are attached. Additionally, a company squad can be split in two, forming combat squads. Such an organizational structure makes the battle companies highly flexible. They are frequently split into two demi companies, each under the direct command of a lieutenant. A battle company will go to war with a vast arsenal of war gear 
and specialist equipment. Far too much for it to use at any single time. Including Phobos armor, Gravis armor, Centurion and Invictor war suits, land speeders, bikes, and rack after rack of weaponry. No squad will be lacking for the equipment it needs to fight its war. An entire company can fight a campaign of stealth, every one of its number donning Phobos armor that enhances their agility and speed, and bearing sophisticated equipment that scrambles communications. Even the squads themselves can be broken down to fight in a variety of roles should their captain require it. Should three brothers be detached from their fire support squad to form an eliminator squad, the remaining seven can form a hell blaster squad, pilot in victor war suits, or fulfill a number of other roles for their squad designation, including operating the company's rhino and impulsor transports. Should the awesome fighting power of a battle company be deemed insufficient for a campaign, it is supplemented by reinforcements from one of the reserve companies. If the captain expects that he will need more fast-moving forces to rapidly secure ground or counter agile enemies, he will request one or more close support squads. In the event that he expects his forces to fight atop mighty fortress battlements, defending against endless hordes of Xenos foes, additional fire support squads will be immensely valuable to lay down the punishing fire needed to destroy the enemy. Each battle company maintains its own pool of Rhino, Razorback, and Impulsor vehicles, so that its entire strength can be moved rapidly across the battlefield. But there are times when even Space Marines need armored and air support. For these resources, the commander issues the armory with his requirements to acquire the swift gunships, thundering siege tanks, and powerful anti-air assets he needs to ensure victory. Reserve Companies The companies of reserve are a vital element of a chapter's organization. For all their adaptability, fury, and valor, the battle companies nevertheless sustain losses in the savage war zones in which they fight, or are not number enough for the hordes of enemies they face. The 6th through the ninth companies are therefore designated reserve companies, one of their primary tasks being to reinforce the battle companies. The tenets of the Codex Astartes dictate that the reserve companies serve the chapter by maintaining the battle company's next generation of warriors. It is a task of great import, for in their time in these formations, space marines will further develop their skills and gain vital experience. When a battle company suffers losses in the tumult of war, it is from the reserve companies that replacements will be drawn. Rather than formations of mixed squad types, the reserve companies contain squads of the same strategic designation. The 6th and 7th companies each maintain 10 battle line squads, and the 8th and 9th companies 
are made up of purely close support and fire support squads, respectively. The reserve companies have the responsibility to embed additional specialties to provide the chapter with the resources it needs to fight its bloody campaigns. The 6th and 7th companies undergo extensive training in all manner of transports, land speeders, battle tanks, and even gunships. With these swift assault vehicles, space marines of these companies serve to provide highly mobile firepower, launch devastating flank attacks, and smash apart enemy lines. The close support squads of the 8th Company storm defenses, exploiting weaknesses to make a victory-winning breakthrough. Their well-timed assaults have earned the admiration of their battle company brothers on numerous battlefields. Armed with a plethora of heavy weapons, the squads of the 9th Company excel at providing devastating salvos of covering fire, knocking out enemy strong points and blowing apart their armored columns. Typically, squads from the reserve companies will serve alongside the battle companies, though on some occasions, particularly if much of the chapter is fighting in one war zone, a reserve company might fight as a whole. Such is the genius of the Codex Astartes, that should it be necessary, ad hoc task forces in demi or even battle company strength are created entirely from the squads of the reserve companies. A lieutenant or captain from the companies of reserve will be nominated to take command of such a force and has the power to request armored support as necessary. The leadership of each reserve company follows that of the battle companies with a captain, chaplain, lieutenants, apothecary, ancient, and veterans. Each captain has additional roles and duties in line with his counterparts in the battle companies. Depending on the chapter, or even chapter master, some of these will be ceremonial, though others will be essential tasks the chapter cannot function without. Again, the Codex has stipulations as to what these should be but allows for flexibility and individual chapter traditions. The captain of the sixth company of a chapter, strictly following the codex, will be the master of the rites, and the seventh company captain, chief victualler. The captain of the eighth company is lord executioner, and the ninth company captain is master of relics. Among the essential functions delegated to these officers are the maintenance and codification of the chapter's customs and conventions, the logistics of non-martial resources, the management of the chapter's serfs, the enforcement of the chapter's strictest punishments and the satisfaction of its grievances and the oversight and security of the chapter's irreplaceable artifacts. Every space marine takes pride in their captain's duties and willingly aids him in carrying them out whenever called upon to do so. It is through these companies that a space marine progresses after they have left the 10th company. In the 9th company, they hone their understanding of wider battlefield strategy, 
in the application of heavy firepower against the most vital targets. The Eighth Company teaches them the value of the rapid assault, the importance of constant movement, and the precision required to carry out the perfect feint. In the Sixth and Seventh Companies, they prove to their battle brothers and commanders that they have assimilated every teaching of the reserve companies and have forged them into an unbreakable weapon of experience, skill, and duty. They must be masters of all manner of combat, as adept in every battlefield situation as they are familiar with every verse of the Codex Astartes and other tomes of lore that the chapter holds in high esteem. Only once they have demonstrated their worth are they welcomed into the ranks of the battle companies, who can trust in their courage, determination, and expertise from the off. Scout Company In a galaxy home to horrors and threats unnumbered, even the mighty space marine chapters suffer losses in the ceaseless grinds of war they fight. It is the vital duty of the scout company to take the rawest aspirants and metamorphose them into fully-fledged space marines so that the ranks may ever be full. The Codex Astartes states that a chapter's 10th company is the scout company. Every space marine in a chapter that follows the Codex has passed through it, including the mightiest of heroes. Marnius Calgar of the Ultramarines, Dante of the Blood Angels, and Kayvon Shrike of the Raven Guard all remember their formative years as a part of this body and the missions they completed which taught them so much. There are no regulations dictated by the Codex as to the number of neophytes a chapter may have. The recruitment rate is not fixed and methods differ between chapters. The Ultramarine's stellar dominion is replete with academies where youths train and compete to join the Adeptus Astartes, meaning there are always plentiful neophytes aspiring to join Gilliman's gene sons. The Salamanders, on the other hand, recruit almost exclusively from their homeworld of Nocturne, and their particularly meticulous methods result in a relatively low number of scouts serving in their seventh company. The scout company is arguably the most important. Such are its responsibilities. A novitiate must prove himself worthy as a scout before being awarded the honor of donning the black carapace, the final implant that allows a space marine to operate their power armor effectively. Chaplains, librarians, apothecaries, and officers all closely observe the aspirants as they progress in their training. Only those who perform admirably on the battlefield demonstrate the chapter's most valuable characteristics and show complete learning of the Codex Astartes and their Primarch's teachings will progress to become full space marines. Scouts learn the way of the sacred bolt gun and the blade, the sniper rifle, the shotgun, and the heavy bolter. They learn how to handle the fearsome power of space marine bikes, 
and the dizzying velocities of land speeders. They also learn how and when to best strike against the foe. When the optimum moment to tactically withdraw arrives, and how to identify, isolate, and exploit enemy weak points. Their manner of war is that of stealth, reconnaissance, sabotage, raiding, and disruption. They gather vital battlefield intelligence, pick off sentries that might betray a space marine assault, mercilessly cut down enemy patrols that disrupt their chapter's plans, and destroy ammunition and fuel dumps to leave their foes woefully under-equipped. All of these hazardous missions put the scouts under immense pressure, all the better to test the widest array of skills, measure their strength of will and commitment, and ascertain who truly has the adaptability required of a space marine. Much like the venerated warriors of the first company and the stalwart brothers of the reserve companies, scouts are often attached to different space marine forces and are rarely deployed in a singular formation. They fight alongside the warriors they hope to one day call Battle Brother with great vigor, determined to prove their worth. The fully inducted Battle Brothers expect nothing less, and look upon the warriors of the Tenth with pride. They have all served their time in the company, and know the rigors the novitiates and newly initiated face. Since his return, Rabute Gilliman has revised the Codex Astartes to allow for the inclusion of Primaris Space Marines and the myriad ways in which they wage war in chapter structure. One of the most sweeping of these additions is the creation of a standing force of ten vanguard squads in the scout company. Fighting as infiltrators, incursors, suppressors, eliminators, and reavers, and piloting the rugged Invictor tactical war suits, these expert infiltration warriors are masters of shadow warfare tactics. Their objectives are nothing less than full-spectrum superiority over the enemy. They destroy supply convoys, assassinate leaders, break communications, sabotage transport links, and shatter morale. Whether fighting in support of other task forces or operating independently, they are trusted to perform these missions. To aid them in this, Vanguard squads are equipped with highly sophisticated specialist war gear and given advanced training. There are the grapnel launchers and shock grenades of the reavers, the smoke grenades of the infiltrators, and the jump packs and grav shoots of the suppressors. The Oculus Bolt Carbines and Divinator class auspexes of the Incursors feed directly into the Transpectral Combat Visors. Combined, there is no battlefield data this highly advanced system cannot gather and analyze thanks to an enslaved machine spirit that cogitates vast quantities of variables in seconds. It presents its conclusions to the incursor, giving him timely frontline intelligence he would never have acquired otherwise. Suppressor squads 
are clad in unique ominous pattern armor, formed by gelling elements of both Gravis and Phobos patterns. With inbuilt shock absorbing servo plates, they can handle the immense recoil of their rapid firing cannons, which launch salvos of foot long armor piercing rounds. The Eliminator's bolt sniper rifles possess customizable scopes perfect for any battlefield situation and can fire numerous types of deadly ammunition. Hyperfrag rounds explode in a hail of lacerating shards that shred infantry. Executioner rounds are miniature self-guiding missiles that seek out and destroy targets embedded in cover and are even capable of changing direction. Mortis rounds cause the complete collapse of the target's biological systems thanks to the mutagenic toxins contained within them. Reclusium a chapter's reclusium is a hallowed place. Reverent silence is punctuated only by chaplains chanting liturgies and administering rites, and the gentle footfalls of robe-wearing serfs. Shrines line its alcove walls dedicated to fallen heroes. The chapter's primarch and holy relics from the Brotherhood's glorious history. The Reclusium is a place of immense cultural and spiritual significance to a Space Marine chapter. This central shrine is the primary place where prayer and worship is conducted. Though most chapter fleets have their own cathedrums and chapels for those space marines on campaign. In the reclusium, the chapter's chaplains, led by the Master of Sanctity and Reclusiarch, preserve ancient traditions, conduct meditations, and perform ceremonies of indoctrination, vindication, and inauguration. To space marines, these are no less vital to their purpose as warriors than their skill at arms, the maintenance of their battle gear, or their honor role. Almost all of a chapter's most precious relics are secured in the reclusium. Company and chapter battle standards hang from the cold walls in shimmering suspenser fields. Fragments of armor worn by the chapter's legendary heroes are presented side by side with ornately crafted blades and hammers and the bleached skulls of vaunted champions. Other artifacts include the quills used by enlightened warriors who scribed majestic works of battle wisdom, or bolter shell casings collected from battlefields where the greatest glories were won. Many hundreds of serfs work to preserve a chapter's relics, each a master of metallurgy, gilding, and other crafts. Multiple generations spend their entire lives polishing a single relic blade, have the sole task of picking broken chainsword teeth from sundered battlefields, or keeping the reclusium's many thousands of ceremonial candles lit, with the tallow of their own bodies removed from them upon their demise to produce more. Even in death, they still serve. 
Keeping these wondrous artifacts safe is a great honor and solemn duty for the chaplains and those training to join their austere ranks. And they work closely with the chapter's master of relics, if such an officer exists within the chapter's structure to do this. The master of relics selects an honor guard from the reclusium made up of warriors from his company or the chapter at large. It is not unheard of for some chapters to have scores, perhaps hundreds, of investigatus and elector helots poring over ancient lore, forgotten texts, and fading after-action reports, searching for the slightest hint of knowledge as to where more relics might be discovered. They will pass on this information to teams of recovery acolytes or even space marines dispersed around the galaxy in the hunt for artifacts that tell of the chapter's historic deeds. In stark contrast to the deep care they take of their own chapter's relics, chaplains make it their task to topple Xenos idols, cast down false prophets, purge heretical shrines, and destroy heathen artifacts and lore. This they do with iron-hard conviction, exhorting their brothers to do the same. The chaplains themselves are the chapter's spiritual authorities and wrathful warrior priests. They are regarded with awed respect by their battle brothers for their incredible strength of will and selfless dedication to the chapter, as well as for their faultless knowledge of the chapter's rites, catechisms, and liturgies. They are notoriously fiery and strict, quickly roused to anger by the hated enemy, and closely observant of every brother of the chapter for lapses in devotion. For all their grim demeanor, chaplains care deeply for the spiritual well-being of their brothers. Their booming oratory of the chapter's tenets and dogmas is intended to armor their brothers from heresy and instill in them humility, integrity, and honor worthy of the Emperor's finest warriors and servants. From the moment of his induction to the day of his death, a space marine will interact with a chaplain on a daily basis. As an aspirant and neophyte, his spiritual and cultural training will be conducted by the chaplaincy. As a fully-fledged battle brother, he will be led in prayer by and fight alongside his company's chaplain, a most respected warrior, advisor, and officer who accompanies his charges into the hell of battle again and again with inspiring, zealous fury. Chaplains are as grim in appearance as they are in character. They wear skull-faced death masks and are clad in archaic, ornate armor, the shade of blackest night, adorned with purity seals, devotional pendants, and holy tokens of battle. Many wear thick chains, cloaks, and heavy robes that billow with each purposeful step. Arguably, the most distinctive of a chaplain's badges of office is his Crozius Arcanum. A devastating type of power mace, it crackles with an intense disruption field. Combined with the chaplain's great strength, 
It is a deadly weapon with which its wielder crushes skulls, shatters knees, and caves in armor. There are multiple ways by which a space marine can become a chaplain, and these vary from chapter to chapter. Many space marines who have felt the calling to join the chaplaincy follow the path of the judiciary. They are given a mighty executioner relic blade and mysterious tempor mortis an archaeotech relic incorporating esoteric stasis technology and filled with all manner of material spiritually important to the chapter, such as sand from their home world. The judiciar can use the tempor mortis to direct stasis energy at his foes, seriously hampering their ability to fight. This device symbolizes the judiciary's need for patience, as well as representing the need for them to earn their role. Judiciaries are sworn to silence. It is their duty to embody the chapter's values, forbidden to speak until they can live them, or any can simply recite litany in verse. For all the deep reverence in which the chapters, reclusium, mighty ship-based cathedrums, and other places of sanctity are held, the battlefield is seen as no less of a place to honor chapter and primarch. Chaplains lead from the front, smashing aside foes as they recite litanies of death, invocations of slaughter, and credenia of blood. Around them, their brothers are inspired to righteous fury, roaring oaths of their own as they hack down enemies with chain swords and power axes, or blast them apart with bolt and plasma fire. To a great many chaplains and space marines, there is no more devout offering to their spiritual lieges and no greater symbol of their dedication than mountainous piles of enemy dead. Apothecarian The Apothecarian is a Space Marine chapter's most vital facility. On its metal Medicaid slabs, neophytes are implanted with the organs that transform them into Space Marines and those grievously wounded in battle receive life-saving treatment. Deeper within the apothecarian, the chapter's gene seed is held, and to the apothecary's falls the honor of its safekeeping. A chapter's apothecarian never sleeps, whether it be on the home world in its magnificent fortress monastery or aboard its galaxy-traversing flagship. The aroma of antiseptics and disinfectants hangs thickly in the air, dispersed by lobotomized servo meds or part-human, part-machine cherubim swinging unwieldy sensors. Dozens, if not hundreds, of iron Medicaid slabs are in use by space marine, aspirant, and serf alike. Around them loom apothecaries, assisted by Medicaid serfs administering balms or carrying out detailed operations, aided by pneumatic servo arms equipped with savage-looking surgical tools and operated by slaved machine spirits. Whether in the middle of a complex procedure, performing administrative duties, or cleaning the blood from a surgical slab, med helots intone endless chants of purity, healing, 
and sterility. These gentle tones are frequently drowned out by the screeching of surgical drills, the screams of the wounded, and the cracking of bones being reset. Adeptus Astartes chapters are ever at war. The stream of wounded space marines and serfs in need of life-saving treatment never ending. A chapter's constant recruitment methods ensure that there are always neophytes in need of organ implantation or surgery following the terrible injuries many suffer in their arduous training. Most space marines undergo periodic treatments, surgeries, or therapies for their entire lives to maintain a stable metabolism. And for this, they must go to the apothecarian. Simply by their fragile human nature, the tens of thousands of serfs that spend their lives working for a chapter will become sick or injured in the course of carrying out their duties. A chapter's apothecarian is where the bio vaults containing the bulk of its gene seed are stored, though many vessels will have the means to transport gene seed safely and securely. This makes the apothecarian one of the most vital locations in a fortress monastery and often they are maintained at their very center, constructed with additional armor and blast-absorbing walls. Should gene seed reserves be in any way threatened by an enemy, all space marines in a chapter will fight to the death in their defense, few with more vigor than the apothecaries. During the Badab War, the Salamander's battle barge, Pyre of Glory, was boarded by secessionist forces. Master apothecary Harath Shin won renown defending the vessel's gene seed vaults, hacking down traitor after traitor to preserve the legacy of his chapter's fallen. All gene seed is examined closely on a regular basis for faults of any description. With any failing to meet the required standard being destroyed. Nevertheless, some chapters are forced out of desperation to use gene seed of lower quality. While a rare few even deliberately foster deformed zygotes and implant them in their, their aspirants. This is a highly dangerous practice, regarded as heretical by many. In the era Indominus, with so many chapters cut off from much of the Imperium, no few will have resorted to this if they deemed it necessary. To catalog the data accrued in the stringent examinations of their gene seed, some chapters maintain vast memory banks, which are used in the training of future apothecaries. In a great many respects, the future of the chapter is in the apothecary's hands. Responsible for all the apothecarian's wide array of essential tasks is the chief apothecary, whose exact title will vary from chapter to chapter. He is one of the chapter's most senior officers and is highly respected for his deep knowledge of the chapter's genetics. Years of battlefield experience saving his battle brother's lives and the due care for his chapter's future he oversees with meticulous diligence. Apothecaries in training are under the tutelage of the chief apothecary and serving apothecaries. To acquire all the nuanced and detailed knowledge 
an apothecary must have to perform even their most basic functions takes many years. Many serve as helix adepts in infiltrator squads. Owning their skills in trying battlefield conditions deep behind enemy lines while utilizing the Helix Gauntlet, a scaled down version of the Narthissium. A Codex Adherent chapter has many dozens of apothecaries. At least one of these individuals will serve in each company on a permanent basis with the remainder carrying out the vital tasks of the apothecarian, such as testing gene seed and implanting organs into aspirants. Some chapters assign apothecaries on a permanent basis to their fleet vessels as a part of the ship's limited space marine crew. Fleet-based chapters are noted to rotate apothecaries throughout their ships to ensure that even in the event of a catastrophic defeat in the cold depths of the void, the skills of the apothecaries will live on. Apothecaries are trained warriors as adept with bolter and blade as the battle brothers they accompany on the field. They have to be, for there is nowhere their charges go that they must not. Should a space marine fall, it is the apothecary's solemn, proud duty to restore them to health or recover their gene seed. Whilst they may never attain accolades for great victories won or enemies cast down, every battle brother holds the apothecaries in the highest regard for the dangers they face to reach casualties. It is a great demonstration of a chapter's deep sense of comradeship in action. The cultures of many chapters have impacted on the workings of their apothecaries. Those of the Fire Lords master the arts of cauterization, knowing how to apply the perfect level of heat for the right duration to heal different wounds. Those of the fleet-based rift stalkers, often operating in enemy territory, are far from imperial supply lines, have little access to standard resources, and as such are expert improvisers. Librarius The Librarius is one of a Space Marine chapter's most mysterious institutions. Its members are the librarians, warrior mystics and scholars who have spent decades mastering their psychic talent to lend their chapter great wisdom as well as a fearsome power in battle. Behind locked doors, warded with pentagramic and hexagramic symbols, the librarius thrums with strange activity. Strange lights flash out of the cracks beneath heavy wooden doors. Hideous screams echo down dark corridors whose walls are etched with arcane symbols of shielding and containment. Serfs and scribes shuffle hurriedly about their tasks, clutching tokens and sigils of safeguarding and whispering chants of obviation with their eyes fixed on the floor. In sealed chambers, the space marine librarians see to their duties. Some sit in reflective meditation. Others scry the skeins of fate, beads of sweat falling down faces twisted in effort and concentration. Some fight in practice cages blasting apart servidors and targets with bolts of psychic power, or striking them down with psychically attuned blades and axes. They must train constantly 
to ensure the strength of their willpower. For their greatest foes, the foul abominations of the warp, are ever watchful for weakness. One of the functions of the librarius is the recording of the chapter's history. Depending on a librarian's rank, their precise role in this regard will differ. Lexicanums, the first rank after a librarian has qualified, write reports of battles and wars. The codicers, those of the second rank, carefully scrutinize every entry into the archives. Those who pass through these ranks become apostolaries. The knowledge and wisdom librarians accrue make their counsel highly sought after, and so most strike forces will include a librarian. By far the largest facilities in the librarius are its vast archives, where the chapter's recorded history is stored. Shelving units fill rooms from floor to ceiling, each stacked with ancient vellum tomes and parchment scrolls. Besides them are humming repositories and archaic catalogs full of data crystals. Hundreds of serfs toil day and night, copying from decaying codicils and tracts lest any information be lost. Only the most senior librarians have any true idea of what their archives hold or what lies behind the locked portals of their most secure areas. And even these vastly knowledgeable individuals have only a reasonable understanding of the rest of the archive. Huge quantities of information can be lost for millennia or even forever, through sheer ignorance of its existence. Few chapters have a complete collection of their history. Another of the librarian's essential functions is to screen the chapter's aspirants for the weak-willed and those with psychic potential. They must be merciless for to permit any weakness is to threaten the chapter and its gene seed with corruption. Those recruits, both displaying psychic potential and the strength necessary to become space marines, will be taken directly under the librarian's wings to learn their arcane crafts. Other potential librarians are scoured elsewhere including the Scholastica Sicana. Those selected, known as Acolytum, undergo a process more arduous than even that of their brother space marines. They must survive the trials, training, and implantations to become space marines, as well as learn to master their psychic gifts and protect their minds from the terrible hazards of the warp. If they fail, a fate worse than death awaits in the clutches of the Immaterium's malignant entities. Such are the dangers involved with these practices that some chapters refuse to include a librarius in their chapter. The Black Templars and a handful of other chapters forbid the use of psychic arts, seeing them as blasphemous. Some chapters tolerate their librarians only as a necessary evil, shunning their psyker brothers as much as possible. A number embrace their librarians wholeheartedly, such as the Blood Ravens and Silver Skulls. Over their lives, the librarians will master myriad psychic disciplines and other suitable skills. 
They will learn to manipulate raging infernos with the slightest hand gestures, turn the nightmares of their foes into horrifying reality, detect the movement of demons through warp space, and read the Emperor's tarot. The trained librarian can sense the shock waves and turbulence of starships arriving in a system from the insanity of warp space and detect the echoes they leave from plunging into its depths. The powers of the chapter's chief librarian, its most senior psyker, are truly formidable. Librarians are as vigilant for weakness in their own number as well as the rest of the chapter. They scour the minds of their battle brothers taking careful record of every deviancy, however minor. It pains many to scrutinize their brothers in such a way, but purity of mind is something that a chapter cannot compromise on. The librarians subject those space marines who have suffered particularly intense psychic trauma at the hands of nefarious Xenos races or the blasphemous forces of chaos to meticulous screening and cleansing. The principal reason for this is to ensure the purity of the chapter's gene seed, for it may become corrupted, and the librarians work closely with the apothecarian to eradicate weakness wherever it is found. Librarians are far more than battle psychers. They identify other psychers, ensuring hidden threats are rendered visible. The skills of apostolaries, in particular, enable them to communicate across interstellar space in the same manner as the astropaths of the Adeptus Astrica Telepathica. They are so powerful they have no need to undertake the torturous soul-binding ritual to do so, though to attempt such a message is enormously taxing and has been known to kill those who attempt it. Armory Whether aboard a colossal, star-faring warship or deep within its mountainous fortress monastery, a chapter's armory is where the great majority of its armored vehicles, gunships, weapons, and war gear are maintained and tended to when they are not being unleashed upon the Emperor's foes. The armory is both a branch of the chapter hierarchy and physical location. Headed by uncanny and knowledgeable masters of the forge, the chapter's tech marines all belong to the armory and are responsible for thousands of serfs and servitors. Their task is to ensure that the chapter's war gear and weaponry are repaired and their machine spirits placated so that they are ready to face the enemy in future conflicts. Whilst every chapter's armory is different in form, structure, and size, they share many common traits. Each is a vast complex of immense forge furnaces, cells, and alcoves, lit by crackling braziers and cold lumen. Servo skulls, formed from the craniums of favored chapter serfs upon their death and affixed with precision servo tools or bearing important messages, fly throughout the air. Service to the chapter rarely ends in death. Each of a chapter's vehicles and war suits has its own antechamber that is a shrine in itself adorned with purity seals and vows of fidelity and devotion, scratched by serfs onto scraps of parchment. 
Every Space Marine vehicle is given a name upon its induction to the chapter to reflect its role as a warrior and is embraced as a battle brother itself. Its alcove is adorned with trophies and relics from the battle it is fought in and the Space Marines it has fought alongside laying down the skulls of slaughtered foes or the sanctified weapons of enemy champions. Thousands of serfs, techno thralls, mecha helots, and servidors labor day and night in the scorching heat of the armory, all caked in ash, drenched in sweat, and stained with oils. Such is the thickness of the smog and sacred incense in the air. Even servidors are regularly replaced, their mechanical systems clogged and biological components choked. Human serfs breathe recycled air through rebreathers, though even this equipment fails to protect them from all of the particulates that blacken the air. The reek of burning metal, lapping powders, and blessed oils add to the heavy and cloying stench. The serfs' lifespans are rendered measurably shorter than their fellows working for the chapter elsewhere, and these laborers are often prone to terrible injuries in their work. Such is the wrath of the machine spirits not treated with due care. The barrage on the senses is made complete by the cacophony of industrial workings and intoned sacred rites. The clang of piston hammers striking sheet metal rings through vaulted chambers. The curt orders of the tech marines are barely audible over the roar of adamantine grinders and plasma cutters. All this is set against the sonic backdrop of constantly droning servidors, endlessly repeating binary chants of reverence, and the serfs' liturgies of dedications. The Adeptus Astartes and Adeptus Mechanicus hold ancient pacts. Chapters may send those of their numbers most at one with technology to Mars to learn the ways of the machine. During their long and arduous training, they are inducted into the machine cult. They learn the hymnals of maintenance, the liturgies of re-sanctification, and the rites of appeasement and awakening. If no space marines did this, it would be impossible for chapters to make war, for soon their weapons, war gear, and battle tanks would fall into disrepair. Those who return from the Red Planet do so as tech marines, now aloof from their brothers. They develop dual loyalties to the machine cults of Mars as well as their chapter, but nevertheless fight bravely for their brotherhood, and their skills and knowledge are regarded highly. Tech Marines' proficiency as drivers, gunners, and pilots is especially recognized. Once they have interfaced with a vehicle's machine spirit, the bond formed is lethally effective. The Master of the Forge is the most senior Tech Marine in the chapter. His grasp of arcane sciences and the mysteries of the Omnisire are such that his skills are on par with those of the Martian Tech Magi. He calms the most belligerent of machine spirits with but a whisper of a Tech Psalm and can heal terrible wounds in a battle tank's hull at incredible speed. As with the Tech Marine brethren they command, 
masters of the forge are regarded with a degree of mistrust by chapter command, with some shunned on matters unrelated to their specialization. In chapters such as the Iron Hands and Astral Knights, which are more embracing of the mysteries of technology, they are revered individuals. These exceptions are relatively few. However, some masters of the forge earn admirable reputations. A Space Marine chapter has thousands of biomechanical slaves known as servitors. Whether they are vat-grown in artificial nutrients or created from failed aspirants or mind-wiped and lobotomized criminals, they are fitted with an array of mechanical tools to carry out the chapter's work. Many have limbs replaced with infrared sensors, bionic exoskeletons, huge claws, flux torsion drills, or even heavy weapons. Servitors are made resilient by their modifications, though their minds are utterly unfeeling and incapable of coherent, independent thought. Without the guidance of a tech marine, they become mind lock, babbling incoherent nonsense until given instruction. <laughs> 